I've just finished Heather Perry's book, Orpheus Builds a Girl. It was terrifying and also wonderful. It is a true story, but also not, which I think is a very important lesson for today. How do we know what's true? We'll be talking about this more and you'll be hearing from Heather Parry and her terrifying views. Kirsty Logan is a Scottish horror novelist. She's written quite a few books now. This is her most recent one, which will be out next year. Um, but I do wonder if it is some kind of confession. Now she is witch. She, of course, wouldn't write, now I am witch. She would write as if it's someone else. But I do wonder, is it a cry for help? Is she being kept in her flat in a cauldron? Is she turning into bats at night? We just don't know. I chose these stories to share today because I want to show that stories can change your life and they will change your life, whether you like it or not. We've chosen this set of stories in particular because I think it really does give a range of the dangers at play in Scotland. It really is a quite horrifying country. And, you know, I came to this country eight years ago and I've been trying to leave ever since and the stories won't let me. There are a lot of stories in this country and they're all true. And maybe we should stop telling them. Maybe we're summoning something. Or maybe we should keep telling them. Maybe we're holding it back. There's just no way to know. When I think about how these stories relate to the country that we're in, that country being Scotland, I think it really just goes to show what a truly haunted people the Scottish people are. And I think that goes for anyone who comes here and anyone who will ever leave. It's very much the Hotel California of a country. John Lees writes comics and he writes horror comics. The thing is, do we know where he gets these ideas from? He'll probably say that he makes them up or maybe he says he gets them from the idea shop, which is what a lot of writers say. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much of these clown stories are taken from real life. I think we need to think about that. John Lees writes horror comics, and I believe he is from Rutherglen. And what a lot of people don't know is Rutherglen is where the rest of the country actually gets its clowns from. There's the uh, largest clown nursery in the whole of Europe. I think the previous one was in Poland somewhere, but the, the clown industry in, in Scotland has really taken off in the last 10 years. My name is John Lees. I'm a comic book writer, mostly of horror, and the two books I'm arguably best known for are Sink and Hotel, both of which have clowns prominently featured in their iconography. I remember an interviewer had asked me once, why do you feel compelled to tell stories about clowns? If you were a kid of my generation, growing up in the early 90s in Glasgow or one of its surrounding areas, Rutherglen in my case, odds are you will know about this particular urban legend. The story goes that a dirty old blue van was trawling through the streets on the hunt for lone children, and inside, the van was filled with clowns. Supposedly, these were escapees from the State Hospital for the Criminally Insane in nearby Carstairs. Accounts varied in describing what happened to the children snatched by these clowns. Some said the kids were killed. Some said they were eaten. Some said they were turned into clowns themselves, their mouths scarred up with razors. One oddly quaint variation was that the side of your mouth would be slit, then the clowns would tickle you to make you laugh and make the scars grow bigger. But most often, what you heard was that the kids would just disappear, never to be seen again. And this really caught on. School dances had to be cancelled due to the large volume of children reluctant to be out after dark. And there were instances of playgrounds going into hysterics if a blue van happened to park by the school gates. At one point, they had to send a local policeman into our class to tell us there was absolutely no such thing as blue van clowns which, as a kid, only serves to convince you that the grown-ups are hiding something. 
I would have been about seven years old at the peak of Glasgow's climb mania and clearly all this mass panic had a profound effect on me as I started to have a recurring nightmare. In this dream, I'm alone in an empty street. I'm walking towards a blue van and I know what's going to be in there. I know I don't want to be here, but because it's a nightmare, I can't stop. I keep on walking closer and closer, my vision honing in on the handle at the back door, knowing what comes next. The handle clicks, the door slowly opens, and out steps this hideous, filthy man, his limbs all coiled up, his head turned down and away from me. His feet drop down onto the concrete, he stands upright, and he's so tall, like a giant towering over me. At last, he raises his head, and I see the white face, the red nose. It's a clown. Then he smiles. His lips part, exposing a mouthful of crooked, broken, yellow-brown teeth. And the smile keeps getting wider and wider, revealing more and more teeth, surely bigger than any human mouth can be. I want to scream, but I can't. Then I think I'm going to laugh. And then I would wake up. It was a sunny summer afternoon when everything came to a head. It was the school holidays and I was round visiting my cousin James and he hits me with, we're going clown hunting, you coming? Him and his friends had got the notion in their heads that if no one else was going to stop the blue band clowns it would be up to us. So we all ventured into my aunt's garden hut in search of makeshift weapons. <laughs> I ended up with a hammer I believe. Adequately armed, we embarked on our heroic quest. Honestly, it was a lot of fun. It was a glorious bammy day, the sun shining bright in the sky, the kind of day that's not too common in Glasgow, even in the summer. We laughed, we joked, we chased each other around. But, as afternoon gave way to early evening, and the sun started to wane, I started to get an intrusive, unsettling thought. What would we do if we actually found a pack of clowns? We all clutched our weapons tight, making big talk about how we'd used them, but how much good would they actually do us in a fight for our lives? And then we found the blue van. A detour into a park had led us down a dirt trail behind some houses and abandoned at its end was this faded blue van, its back facing us. It was like the real world peeled away and I was in my nightmare again, walking towards the van, wanting to turn and run but feeling unable. And all I could do was fixate on the door handle waiting for that click, waiting for the clown to emerge with his ghoulish grin. Only this time I would see what happens after he grins. This time I would see. Then one of my cousin's friends rushed past me, swung open the door, and there was no clowns inside. The van was empty, save for an old mattress and some discarded newspapers. We hopped in and out the van and ran around it, whooping and cheering as if we'd achieved something, as if we'd conquered something. As for me, it was certainly a whole lot of relief that my nightmare hadn't come to life and indeed after that day I don't believe I ever had that dream again. But on some level I think there must have been a lot of disappointment that our mission had come to nothing. It was dark by the time we finally got back home. These were the days before smartphones, so we'd all just been missing for the day. My mum was furious, told me I was grounded. By the time the summer was over everyone had moved on from the clowns and I guess I did too eventually for the most part. But some doubts lingered. Who did that van belong to? Why did they leave it out there? Did they go back for it? After we'd been there? For a little while after that day of the clown hunt, those questions ran through my mind as I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, waiting to fall asleep. And every so often, just as my eyes were starting to close, I'd get a disquieting thought. What if, when my eyes opened, and I'd blinked a few times to adjust to the dark, I became aware that I wasn't alone in the room. What if, taking shape out of the darkness, my eyes settled on a figure with dirty clothes and rotten teeth? I'd imagine him standing there, staring, grinning, letting the silence hang in the air, waiting until I knew, he knew I was awake. And then, the clown would open his ragged, scarred mouth and say, You found my bed, so I found yours. Ha, ha. Here's the thing about clowns, you can't trust them and you also don't know where they are. We don't think there are any clowns in here right now, but we, we can't say for sure because they could be anywhere. 
we think because we know about their big red noses and their big floppy shoes and the way that they can fit into a small car, we think that we know them. We think that they're our friends. All my friends have big floppy shoes. And I don't really know what to make of that. I've never asked them why. I have actually been doing a social experiment though where I have been paying people around Glasgow to dress as clowns and make friends with Kirsty Logan in particular to see if she even notices or whether there are this many clowns in Glasgow that it will just pass unnoticed. As I said, they fit into those small cars. So to me, that suggests they can be anywhere. They could fit anywhere. If they can fit so many into one car, really, they could be anywhere. They could be under the chair. We don't know. I'm not going to look because sometimes it's better not to know. I think if we think about it, we can see that what a clown represents is forced humour in the face of humiliation. Yes, we're all laughing, but we're laughing at a person. And I think even when you're a child, you can see that there is an adult inside that clown costume, or maybe it's not a costume, that's just who they are, but you know it's a person. And you instinctively know that as you grow older, labour will be forced out of you by capitalism. and. No, you can try and make a joke out of it, but really it's, it, you're trapped in there. You've got to labor, you've got to um, put the pies in faces, you've got to wear the silly red nose. And I think knowing that this is what will come of your adulthood, that really is a pain that will stay with you for the rest of your life. I don't think I've met a clown in real life. However, as I said, my friends do all have floppy shoes and sometimes they ask me to smell a flower that they're wearing and then it sprays me with water. So maybe I have, maybe everyone I meet is a clown. I, I couldn't say. There's just so much in this world that we don't know and we can never understand. Um, I love that about the world. I love the mystery of the world. I don't love clowns though. They can go away, back to the circus. Um, I would be okay with that. But as I said, they could be anywhere. They could go anywhere. We just, we just don't know. Amanda Thompson is a very well-loved and respected visual artist and writer in Scotland. Um, she lectures as well. And I do, I have heard rumours that she does actually live in the trees and this is why she is so au fait with birds, if you will. Um, I personally don't believe these things. I also always believe that where there is a rumour about someone, it really is saying something about us. And when we say that a visual artist must live with the birds, what we're really saying is we don't understand the creative process. Amanda Thompson is someone who I know to be a lecturer, an academic and a writer. She has a book called Belonging, which is all about the concept of home. She also appears to be a bird expert, which I didn't know. A birdologist, if you will. Um, and again, this is what makes me suspicious. She writes about home, but also she knows a lot about birds. And the thing is, birds don't have a home, do they? They fly and they make a new home. And that is why um, you can't trust birds. There was at one time a large rookery in the alders at Cool Nakail. Captain MacDonald, then holding the farm, 1826, vowed its destruction. He hired a squad of men and boys and set them to work. The boys tore down the nests and the men kept up a constant fusillade so as to prevent the rooks from settling. The war went on for some days. Now and again a bird came too near and fell prey to the marksmen, but most were weary and kept at a safe distance. At last the rooks seemed to recognise they were beaten. They held a gathering in a neighbouring field. There was much cawing and conferring, but no reporter to give their speeches. The question was in due time settled. The rooks, as if acting under orders, arose and flew towards the alders, but instead of settling on the trees, they mounted up high above so as to be safe from all harm. Then they went through a kind of march, sailing calmly to and fro and doubtless casting many a longing glance on their old homes. By and by they altered their tune. The march became a quick step merging into a wild, whirling, commingling dance. 
It was, as a spectator described it, for all the world like a reel of Tullock. The dancers quick and quicker flew, they reeled, they set, they crossed, they click it. Then suddenly there was a stop, with a great co-coing, then utter quietness. Out from the rest flew a leader, took his place in front, and like an arrow from a bow, started off. The others fell into line and followed. Silently, the whole body winged their flight straight for the boat of Cromdale, where, in the firwood over the spay, they established their new home, and where, unmolested, they have dwelt from generation to generation ever since. The Highlanders hold that it is unlucky to disturb a rookery, and it was noted that Captain MacDonald, some years after, had reluctantly to flit from Coolnacaile and to make his home at Clury, which he never loved so well. Birds have very small eyes, and that is very frightening. Um, they have very small eyes, but they can see very well. And how does that work? I mean, Amanda's a birdologist, so I suppose she knows. Um, I'm not a birdologist, so I don't know. I just know that the eyes are really small. Um, and the bones are small as well, but then birds are small. So that probably makes sense, actually. I will let, I will let the birds have that one. That's okay. I think they're scary because they go up. And we can't go up unless we're underwater. Of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with birds. And again, I think it is a type of bigotry to say that they are creepy, that they have small eyes. You know, a lot of people have small eyes. I have an incredibly small head. And if anyone was to say that a person with small eyes would be particularly creepy, I would find that a cause for personal offence. I think birds might come from the pits of hell. Um, we of course know where birds come from because we understand evolution. The scientific method is very clear on how the species in this country, in this world, have evolved over time. Scotland has a lot of birds. Um, I think because we have quite a lot of portals to hell in Scotland. Um, again, I can't say for sure. Again, I just feel it. I just feel like there are a lot of portals to hell um, in Scotland. I think every person who is currently living in Scotland has had a creepy experience with a bird because we all live fairly close to the coast and if you spend any time near sea, you will see a seagull, which let me tell you is actually called a herring gull. They have committed murder. They do commit murder on a daily basis. They are terrible social criminals and we just have to keep quiet about it because no one would ever visit. The thing, the thing about birds, um, I actually did marry a bird once and I'm not saying that that's why I have these sort of negative feelings towards them, but it can't help. It really can't help. We're not in touch anymore. It's, I mean, it's for the best, um, but it, it didn't go that well. So um, I wish them well. Um, I wish we could stop talking about birds. Anna Chung is a poet and she's bringing us a story about the Bin Nai, uh, who is a hag who washes clothes. Um, I identify quite intensely with that. Um, I think I was born a hag, actually. Um, I feel like I have real hag energy um, and I think I have since I was a baby, really. And a hag baby might seem a strange concept, but if anyone looks at pictures of me as a baby, I think they will, they will understand. Anna Chung is a hugely exciting um, young poet from Glasgow. She has actually written a uh, poetry collection, or you could say academic uh, thesis, called Where Decay Sleeps, which to me asks the question, what does it mean to be dead, really? Is it decay that sleeps? Or when we are decomposing in the ground, is it then that we are truly alive? This is why it makes her such an intelligent person to include. Hi, my name's Anna Chung and I'm the author of Where the Key Sleeps. I'd like to tell you the tale about the Bean Nye, but first of all, who was she? In Scottish folklore, the Bean Nye haunted desolate streams, washing the blood from clothes and linen. It is said that they were spirits of women who died at childbirth and that their spirits were doomed to wash bloody garments after death. Some believe that she had the power to see into the future. Others believe that she could grant wishes while other stories were 
far more sinister. <gasps> Shh! Did you hear that? Let's tread carefully and I'll tell you the tale of the Bean Nye of Glen Arros. In the dark of the night, over the trees of Glen Arros, a cry coiled from the forest, strangling roots like a serpent ensnared in the woodland web. Aldith laid on her bed, eyelids heavy in dream, hair latticed across rose-tinted cheeks, pale yet feverish in a fitful sleep. The sound slithered into the shadows through creaky windows and splintered doors, poisonous and sinewy in the deadly silence. The cry was half human, half creature, and dragged Aldith from the arms of slumber. She stumbled barefoot onto the stone-cold floor. She wandered weary into the woodland, the thorns, pines and nettles snagging flesh, but finally she found her way to the water's edge. There, bent over by the brook, she saw a woman as gnarled and crooked as ancient trees, her claw-like feet clung onto the lichen rocks as she scrubbed a pile of blood-stained rags. Closer and closer Aldith creeped, but alas, the old hag had already foreseen. With one eye, the creature honed in on the girl and spat, snaggletooth, into the brook. Aldith recoiled at the sight of the crone. I am a seer, messenger from the other world. Come near, a knowledge I will impart to your heart's desire. Curious, the girl stepped closer and asked for her name. Some call me Banshee, some call me Lavondier. I am Binai, the Midnight Washerwoman. Why be feared of me? Come hither and I shall tell you more. All the inch forward, the rocks were slippery sleek. I wash the clothes of mortals soon to drift on their underworld journey to death's abyss. Come, look. Upon hearing those words, the girl's heart lurched. There, against the hag's saggy breast clutched, she saw her own frog, sodden on rocks and botched with blood. She staggered and fell into the water. I think household chores are the true terror. Um, I think the fact that we have to live in homes that need to be clean is um, cruel, really. Um, I think dust could be our friend. Um, and again, could be anything in there. Dust, very small. Um, bird's eyes, clowns, could be anything. Um, which doesn't have to be a bad thing. Maybe we could make peace with it? I'm not sure because I don't like clowns and birds. But, but, I think there's a conversation to be had. That's all I'll say. Household chores actually feature quite a lot in folklore, and that's because to us they represent a kind of Sisyphean task. What we like to believe is that we have free will, and that every day we wake up and we are making free choices to go about in the world, to create, to love, to procreate. But really, we're just coming back home and doing the washing or mopping a floor, and the floor never gets any cleaner. And this does really represent the kind of pain of being an adult. I think if it were possible to employ the characters from folk tales to do our domestic labour, and assuming that they consented to that and that we could compensate them appropriately, um, I don't know that currency would be the best. Um, they might want bones, um, they might want souls, um, they might want babies. We don't know. We can ask them, though. There might be a union, and um, perhaps we could discuss it with them. Um, I think it could work, though. Um, I really think it could. I think, you know, we would need to make sure that everybody felt that it was a fair deal. Um, but I think I think it could be done. I think the, the witch, the handsome Gretel witch, um, she's good at cooking, you know, so I don't see why those skills couldn't be used for good. Um, no, I think I think that could that could work really well. Um, I'm glad that I thought of it. Crone is a word that's very dear to my heart. Um, again, I think I was born a crone. Um, 
so I like that. I really like that. I also really look forward to uh, my wrinkles becoming much larger um, as time passes, as it does for all of us. Um, I would like to keep things in there. Um, I would like to hide things, maybe small messages or um, items that I need to carry around with me. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a good time. Also, I like that I can um, elbow children out of the way in the street. To be fair, I haven't seen crones doing that. Maybe I could start it. It could be a trend. When I think of the word crone, I really do picture Kirsty Logan. She's always had, I will say it again, haggitude. In fact, I've seen photos of when she was a child and she really was just like a tiny little crone woman. If anything, she's just gotten larger. Ailsa Dixon is a oral storyteller um, who's just really coming up in the literature world of Scotland. She's a very exciting figure to keep an eye on. Um, I also think she represents a link to Scotland's past um, oral storytelling history, which we don't engage with so much today because we're obsessed with writing things down. And if we think about why we are obsessed with writing things down, it's a type of confession. We think that if we put things on paper, they will be removed from us, but they don't. They sit in your brain and then they sit in your desk and then they burn, they burn inside of you, this fear of being found out for what you've done. Elsa's free of all that. Elsa Dixon is a storyteller from Aberdeenshire. And the thing about Aberdeenshire is it's got a lot of stories, so she's very well placed to be telling them. My grandparents lived on a farmhouse on the Orkney Islands. And if you were to walk out of their house, down the path, round the hill and across a stream, you would come to a cottage. The sort of cottage that you find all over the Orkney Isles. A ruined one with the walls half tumbling down, the roof long since gone and the door blown in eons ago. But this cottage, why well, this cottage was special. Because when my grandmother's grandfather was still just a boy, a man lived in that cottage. His name was Tam. And he lived alone because he never married or had children and his parents had long since died. So he was a fairly lonely man. The highlight of his month was market day, when he would take what little he had to sell, gather up the bits of money he had and head down to Strumnets for the market. And he enjoyed the market. He loved it a lot. Because, well, he got to talk with people he didn't often get to see, his old friends and the other farmers, the fishermen from about the islands. He got to learn a bit about their lives and then, if there was time before the sun started to set, he'd go and have a wee drown in the pub. But Tam, he never wanted to walk home in the dark. He always made sure there was plenty time to get back to his cottage before the sun set. But today, this particular day when this particular story happened, it was one of those September days, it's almost the end of summer, almost the start of autumn, when the sun seems to disappear far sooner than anyone is expecting, as if it's been chased by the night right over the globe. And when Tam finally, after his third or maybe fourth dram, opened up the door of the pub, he was almost blown back by a fierce Orkney gale and he looked up and out to see the sun staling the sea scarlet over at the horizon and the moon starting to come up into the sky. He curled his coat closer around him and walked home in the gathering darkness, his way lit by the moonlight and by the thousands of Orkney stars. But he walked faster and faster and faster. And then he heard something. Something that was not his own heavy breathing. It was not the sound of his own footsteps on the path. It wasn't even the way the wind whistled through the corn or the rush of the sea as it lapped forwards and backwards along the beach. It wasn't the calling of the gulls. It was hard, heavy breathing. He turned around and he saw a horse 
standing at the edge of a field, and then he looked closer. When at first it looked like a horse and a rider, now he saw that that was not the case, for what had looked like a rider was actually just a torso fused onto the horse's back. And the rider's head, there was no, there were no eyes in that head, it was just covered over one great skull, and the rider's arms were long. They dangled down onto the ground, and they had webs between each and every finger, but the fingers were more like claws. And then he looked closer, and his blood chilled in his veins. Because the horse and its rider, they had not one scrap of skin upon its body. Tam, Tam, he could see the lungs inflating and deflating beneath the creature's ribcage. He could see its great heart hammering inside both of its chests. It could, he could see the eyes in that horse's head rolling backwards into its skull. He could see the tendons tensed and ready to leap. He could see the blood pumping through its veins. He could see the small intestine. He could see the liver pale and strange. He could see everything. Bile rose in the back of Tam's throat, but he was running because he knew this was the Nuplave. This was the creature that would strip all the flesh from your bones and throw you in the bottom of the lake. And he knew he had not one chance in hell if he was not to cross some running water. So he was running, 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 running towards a stream, and he heard the Nuplave start to trot start to canter, start to gallop behind him, and it was gaining on him, getting faster and faster and faster, and Tan felt his heart pumping inside his chest as he sprinted, tripping over the rocks and stones on the uneven made path, as he saw the Nuplame gaining on him, its great skinless body getting closer and closer and closer, and he watched as the Nuplame got one long arm and scratched at Tam's back, and Tam felt the hot, sticky blood running down his back, felt the pain course through him, but he did not pay it any heed, and he was running faster and faster and faster until he fell into a running river. He felt the cold water rush over him, climbed out onto the shore at the other side, and knew no more. He didn't hear the cry of anguish from the Nuplave, didn't see it disappear into the night. The next thing he knew was the sun coming up again that morning. And he told everyone he could about his time with the Nuplave, but nobody believed him. But they must have liked the story though, because the story survived, because I heard it. And now you have too. Telling stories aloud rather than writing them down is a really good way to not get caught by the police or your boss or your partner or whoever you want to keep secrets from. What we should really take away from Ilsa's piece is that you should never leave a paper trail. The thing is, when you are telling a story out loud or simply talking about yourself or just humming or even making a series of unintelligible noises, you have to realise in the modern day that anyone could be listening to you. You could be being recorded from any kind of device, from any kind of uh, person nearby, they have a phone. All of this is logged onto a gigantic database. I think stories are scarier when they're read aloud because we can't escape from them. Uh, we can close our eyes, we can't close our ears, unless we have earplugs or headphones, or unless we just can't hear. Um, it's complicated, it's very complicated. Here's the thing about horses. They are frightening. They are big. In a way, the opposite of birds, really. They can't go up. Um, and they have quite big eyes. Bones are definitely big. Um, I don't really hold it against them, again, Birds can't help it, horses can't help it either. Um, but just because it's not their fault, it doesn't mean I can't be angry about it. And they're very frightening. Their teeth also are big. That's not really their fault. You know, teeth are bones kind of, but in your mouth. Um, 
Horses are terrifying, I think we can all agree with that. Um, people think it's because they're really large or they run wild in the fields or they may just kick you at any one time, but it's not really that. It's because we all remember the banking adverts from the kind of late 90s where all the horses were running along the beach. This brings in our fear of the coast. We know that water, too much water isn't a good thing, but it also makes us fear of the banking industry, of being adults, of responsibility, of financial failure. It really comes back to a real Freudian place where we just want to do well. I am so scared of horses that I don't want to discuss it anymore. I don't think there's one in here. But again, you just don't know. You just don't know. Um, you know, we've talked about dust. We've talked about birds. We've talked about eyes. We've talked about teeth. I don't know why we were talking about those things because now all I can think about is horses. And I can't, I, I simply cannot. Many people are scared of horses and it is a very common fear, but in fact, we should be scared of the cows. You know, we don't think of them, we think of them as gentle creatures, they're not. If you look very closely, they're really, really, really muscly. Um, and they travel in herds, and if you walk by them in a field, they may charge at you. They're very angry. Cows are very angry people. I have had to escape cows twice in my life so far. Garth Marenghi is an author and dream weaver. Uh, he writes tales of the fantastique. What I would say they're not so fantastique to me. To me, they're more tales of horror. I feel horrified by them. And I think everyone will be when they hear the story. Garth Marenghi is a dream weaver, a visionary peddler of the fantastique. The story we're going to get from him is from his upcoming book, Terror Tome, which will literally be a tome of terror, which is just about as much terror as you can handle. I lowered my voice to a whisper, keeping one eye on the lounge door. Look, I'll level with you. I'm in a highly destructive and damaging psychosexual relationship with my typewriter. Then it is a cursed artifact. Well, you tell me, I said, exasperated. You're the one reading minds. He stared at me for a moment, doing just that. I see you have a subconscious urge to do it with type bars. Yes, I know that. It's all to do with a socially unacceptable love for my own writing. But now it's become something else entirely. I pulled the typewriter's list from my back pocket and handed it over. These are its demands. He ran his eye briefly over the typewriter's words, rolling his tongue quizzically against his cheek. Who owned it before you? No idea. It's eons old. Eons, he said, looking up suddenly. Tang Dynasty, according to the manual, though the English translation's appalling. And where is it now? he asked. I thought you could read minds. He paused for a moment, thinking, then shook his head. And for some reason I can't pick up its thoughts. I pointed conspiratorially at the lounge door behind us. In there. He glanced over at the door, the expression building on his face quite unusual for a Satanist. He looked scared. Who are the pupils of pain? he asked, examining the list again. Well, I assume I'm one of them, I said, but it's also after my editor, Roz. Luckily, she still has dignity and a moral compass. You do realise blank page of unknown suffering refers to your own soul? Really? I presume that was already taken. He looked at me, his expression grave. This is referring to a plane of suffering beyond hell. Beyond hell, I repeated. What on earth would suffering be like beyond hell? The lounge door burst open, swinging back hard against the kitchen wall. Fortunately, I'd attached stoppers when I'd moved in. In the room beyond us, motionless upon my writing desk, sat the typewriter. Glaring. The Satanist dropped the sheet of paper. It's been eavesdropping, he said. Yeah, it channels the subconscious, I'm afraid, I said, which does erode privacy. 
It also goes crackly like a sparkler and shoots barbed hooks through my nipple teats. That's a thing of evil, he yelled out suddenly. An evil beyond Lucifer. An evil beyond hell. With that, he fled from my kitchen and hurled himself through the front door, satanic robe flapping wildly as he ran off down the stairwell. I saw he'd done one on my tiles. As I made a pretense of reaching for the Ajax and some J-cloths, I heard the words I'd been dreading deep inside my head. Oh dear! Morning, I said, and began whistling. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear! That's the typewriter speaking. I sprinkled some Ajax on the offending tile. What's wrong? Out of ribbon again? Turn around! Beg your pardon? I said, commencing to scrub at the tile. Never had cleaning a soiled stain seemed more alluring. I said, turn around now! I realised there was no way of avoiding it. No way at all. I turned around. Punishment time! Well, to find out what that punishment was, by the book. For me, the most erotic part of the writing process is the physical action of putting it down on paper or into transferring your ideas into a computer, if you will, because this is the pinnacle of creation. And of course, creation is what we are all as humans geared towards. Um, it's a very satisfactory feeling, you know, take the horrible thoughts that happen inside of your head and put them out, put them out, put them on the doorstep, let the goblins take them away. I find the whole process of writing erotic. Um, horrifying and erotic at the same time, which is quite confusing, um, which is why writing is quite tiring, which is why it takes such a long time, um, because to be eroticized and horrified at the same time um, takes quite a lot out of you. It's really important to um, keep your vitamins up as well, so um, definitely things like a smoothie, um, that's really good and um, that can really help. And you can put like um, chia seeds and things, um, it's um, they're kind of inherently unerotic chia seeds as well, so it sort of it helps to tamp it down a little bit. Um, so I would I would recommend that. They are a bit like bird's eyes, which is a bit scary, um, but you know it's about balance in life. I think the erotic and the horrifying and um, chia seeds and eyes and you can't have just one or the other. Not just eyes and not just seeds. People ask me whether all writers have a socially unacceptable relationship with their own work, but that makes me ask, what is socially unacceptable? What is so wrong about the love between a person and a book? Um, what is so wrong about the love between a person and a manuscript? I like to sleep next to my work at night. It keeps me safe. I think all writers hate what they write as much as they love it. Um, and that's why we get very tired. We need to have a lot of naps. Um, often I'm criticised for napping more than I write, but I say it's very important and it's part of the process. It's very difficult to be caught in between those two places all the time and to um, have to write our nightmares. So the more naps we have, the more nightmares we have and the more things we have to write about. So it's really part of the work. Um, I consider it part of my daily work to be asleep. In fact, I don't think I'm asleep at the moment. But then that would be true of a nightmare. So who knows? Who knows anything? Have I ever had a relationship with an inanimate object? Why? What have you heard? So most writers will write on a laptop or a computer or even a typewriter. Um, I don't believe that any of them are safe. Um, I actually think it's safer to um, write on something that can be burned because then you can destroy it um, before it destroys you. So um, things like on sand is good. Um, it does take quite a long time to write a novel um, on sand. We have big beaches in Scotland though, so um, that's really helpful, that does help. So if you see words in the sand, um, don't walk on them yet. You can walk on them later. Working with Heather Parry on this project has been erotic, 
fantastic, horroric. Um, I hope to never have to repeat it. Um, she owns a part of my soul now. I didn't mean to give it to her. She tricked me. It's the shoes. The shoes got me. I, of course, love working with Kirsty Logan. Um, she's a brilliant mind. Well, she's a brilliant creative mind. Um, it does pose some challenges to work with her because she does believe that there are clowns in dust. But she was so concerned with my big feet that she didn't notice my tiny bird head. I think Book Shriek Scotland tells us that really every story is a scary story. You've just got to really think about what it means. You know, you might tell a tale of a mouse and a piece of cheese, but really what is the fundamental damage with that mouse? What does the cheese represent? Everything is scary. I hope that viewers will take away from this that Scotland is a place of extreme terror, but also extreme eroticism and also birds horses, dust, clowns, and laundry. Um, some of them might come as a surprise, some maybe not. I don't know how knowledgeable people are about Scotland, but I hope at least one of them will come as a pleasant surprise, and I hope at least one will be a horrifying warning. Because you must love Scotland, but also beware.